Everything from fighter jets to ICBMs, aircraft carriers, and unmanned platforms, stealth planes, special operations, and everything in between. Let us dive into the history and achievements of military technology in this episode of Mill Power. One man who served under General Schriever, who was instrumental to the U.S. ICBM program, was Colonel Edward Nathaniel Hall. Colonel Hall, by 1954, was the chief of the WDD's Propulsion Development, where he oversaw the programs charged with developing rocket engines for the Atlas and Titan ICBMs, along with the Thor Intermediate Range Ballistic Missile, or IRBM. Colonel Hall would go on to be promoted to director of the Thor IRBM development program. Thor was also liquid fueled and was designed for intermediate ranges, maxing out around 1500 miles. Yet for a true storable ICBM to take flight, solid fuels needed work. In a 1973 interview, General Schriever said of solid propellants, a lot of work had been done on solids prior to the initiation of the ICBM program in 1954. But there were a number of things that ruled against using solids at the time. By the mid 1950s, solid propellants weren't powerful enough to grant true intercontinental ranges for a nuclear tipped missile, were difficult to fabricate, hard to ignite, and controlling their burn and thrust was exceedingly complex. In 1956, General Schriever approved a research program headed by Colonel Hall that would investigate high-thrust solid fuel rockets. Later that year, Colonel Hall would fund research at both Boeing and Thiokol into solid propellants, specifically ammonium perchlorate composite propellant, APCP. One of APCP's biggest advantages over powder solid propellants is its ability to be cast into different shapes. The geometry of the propellant inside the vehicle plays a vital role in the engine's performance. Using shapes means changes to the fuel surface area exposed to combustion, and complete burns the propellant from the center of the cast to its edges. This allows for increased burn rate, thus increased thrust. These factors provide both a longer burn and more uniform heat and pressure throughout the motor during flight. Over the course of two years, Colonel Hall and his team would solve most issues linked with the use of solids. The U.S. Air Force, with its Atlas and Titan ICBMs and Thor IRBM, saw no immediate need for a solid-fueled ICBM. Following the process of the solid fuel research program closely was the U.S. Navy. The Navy was looking into nuclear ballistic missiles for their ships and submarines. However, due to the dangerous nature of liquid fuels, the service was skeptical of early missile systems. With the advancement of solids and smaller nuclear warheads on the horizon, the Navy began development of its own ballistic missile, culminating in the UGM-27 Polaris submarine-launched ballistic missile or SLBM. With the Polaris and the USS George Washington to deploy them, the US now possessed a nuclear triad consisting of three legs. Airborne, nuclear weapons deployed from aircraft, primarily bombers. Land-based, ICBMs. And seaborne, SLBMs. In August 1957, the Air Force returned to Colonel Hall for a medium-range, solid fuel, land-based missile as a counterpart to the Polaris. Within weeks, Colonel Hall plotted specifications for a missile with variable range based on assembling its three stages in various combinations. The design, designated Weapon System Q, was envisioned as a weapon for a defense position of minimum cost with maximum retaliatory capabilities. Less than two months later, the Soviet Union would make history by launching the first man-made satellite, Sputnik 1, 
into low Earth orbit atop a modified R7 Simjorka, the world's first ICBM. This sent shockwaves through the West, especially the United States, sparking the Sputnik crisis, a period of anxiety, fear, and paranoia concerning the perceived Soviet technological advantage. This was perfect timing for General Shriver and Colonel Hall, as the atmosphere of the time made selling their new missile a much easier job. Mere days after the launch of Sputnik, the two went to the Pentagon to build support for the new missile system. By the end of the year, Colonel Hall would refine his design for the ICBM version of Weapon System Q, calling for a three-stage solid-fueled rocket, roughly 65 feet long, having 100 to 120,000 pounds of thrust at launch, yet only weighing 65,000 pounds, stored vertically in underground silos and ready to launch at a moment's notice, the missile's high thrust to weight ratio would accelerate it so rapidly it would fly through its own initial exhaust from ignition without sustaining any significant damage. In February 1958, the pair presented Weapon System Q to the Secretary of the Air Force, James H. Douglas Jr., and Secretary of Defense, Neil H. McElroy. Approval for the system came less than 48 hours later, and Weapon System Q was renamed. On the 28th of February, 1958, the New York Times reported the U.S. Air Force has been authorized to produce a new advanced ballistic missile named Minuteman. The OGM-30 Minuteman ICBM was a massive technological leap over America's previous ballistic missiles. The designation LGM represents L, silo launched, G, surface attack, M, guided missile. Contracted to Boeing in October of 1958, the missile would take its first flight from the legendary Cape Canaveral on the 1st of February 1961 at 11am. The launch was a dazzling spectacle according to experienced personnel present. As the missile rose, leaving a column of smoke and flames. One observer described the missile ascending as it shot up like a skyrocket, unlike the liquid fuel Atlas and Titan missiles which left the ground like a fat man getting out of an easy chair. Each stage performed perfectly, completing their burns and detaching without incident. The unarmed warhead splashed down 25 minutes later in the Atlantic Ocean, on target 4,600 miles away. The missile's guidance system, the NS-10Q, was a breakthrough in itself. The system's D-17B computer, designed by the Autonetics Division of North American Aviation, used revolutionary air bearings in the system's gyroscopes to reduce friction and extend the life of the gyroscope. This advanced guidance system allowed the missile to drop its 800 kiloton W-59 warhead within a mile and a half of its intended target and early variants of the missile. In Washington, D.C., now Chief of Staff of the United States Air Force, General Thomas D. White, who gave Project Atlas the highest priority as Vice Chief of Staff, recounted the launch as one of the most significant steps this nation has ever taken towards gaining intercontinental missile supremacy. Even as the missile was in development, the Air Force was already making plans for the deployment of the new Minuteman missile. Minuteman forces would be grouped into wings, each wing divided into three or four squadrons. Squadrons themselves would be subdivided into five individual flights. Each flight would consist of a manned launch control site and be linked to 10 underground missile silos. Originally seeking to station Minuteman missiles in southern states such as Texas, Georgia, and Oklahoma, the Air Force was forced to place them in the northern U.S. due to early missiles falling short of their intended 5,500-mile range. This range shortfall would be later identified as the fault of defective boosters. The first Miniman ICBM installation would be selected in 1960, Maelstrom Air Force Base, Montana. Construction of the missile field began on the 16th of March, 1961. Air Force crews would start lowering missiles into the silos in late July 1962. 
And by the 27th of October 1962, the first 10 missile flights rushed into activation during the apex of the Cuban Missile Crisis. The next Minuteman site would be selected shortly after construction began at Malmstrom, Ellsworth Air Force Base, South Dakota. By now, the U.S. Air Force had rectified the issues with the defective boosters, enabling the missiles to hit their target range. This improvement proved significant enough to warrant the missiles receiving an updated designation of LGM-30B Minuteman 1. Ellsworth's missile wing would come online and become fully operational on the 23rd of October 1963, three weeks ahead of schedule. Additional Minuteman installations would be built at Minot and Grand Forks Air Force Bases in North Dakota, Whiteman Air Force Base, Missouri, and Francis E. Warren Air Force Base, Wyoming. By the end of 1967, 1,000 Minuteman missiles were on alert at six different locations across the central and northern U.S. U.S. nuclear strategy in the late 1950s was one of massive retaliation, an all-out attack utilizing the entire American arsenal to wipe its target off the face of the planet. Shortly after assuming office, President Kennedy learned that in the event of such an attack, a sizable portion of Soviet nuclear forces could survive to strike back. Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara placed forward the recommendation of a flexible response selectively deploying nuclear weapons to strike targets of strategic importance. The initial wave of missiles would target Soviet bombers and missile sites, crippling their ability to wage nuclear warfare. With the remaining ICBMs held in reserve, the leadership of the Soviet Union would have a choice. Surrender, or face total annihilation. To achieve this new strategic policy, America's nuclear forces were retooled, including the Minuteman ICBM. By the time the last Minuteman deployments were finalized, the Air Force had already developed a significantly improved variant of the missile, the Minuteman II. The LGM-30F Minuteman II took its first flight on September 24, 1964. This weapon marked a radical evolution of the Minuteman system providing a greater payload, more flexible targeting, and improved range. However, a potential weakness of the Minuteman system was put on display in March 1964 when the Soviet Union paraded anti-ballistic missiles, or ABMs, in Moscow's Red Square. With LGM-30s carrying one warhead per missile, a sufficient quantity of ABMs could, in theory, neuter the Minuteman's offensive capabilities. To counter this, research was poured into an insane concept. Independent warheads that could separately strike their own targets simultaneously and multiple independently targetable re-entry vehicles, or MIRVs. Imagine a single missile capable of striking a nation's capital city, nuking its head of state's palace, legislative assembly, and military central command all at once. Pair this with a larger, more accurate, more powerful missile, and by the summer of 1968, you get the LGM-30G Minuteman 3. The New York Times described the new missile and its capabilities to render current and contemplated anti-missile defense systems largely inadequate, and how the weapon would thrust the world into a new era a weapons for mass destruction. The first Minuteman 3s marked a major evolution in America's ICBM force, capable of striking targets up to 8,000 miles away with this W62 170 kiloton warhead within 800 feet of its intended target in roughly 30 minutes or less. In December of 1979, the newer, more powerful W78 warheads would be deployed doubling the explosive yield from 170 kilotons to 350 kilotons. Entering service in 1970, the LGM-30G Minuteman III remains the United States' go-to land-based nuclear deterrent today. 
our arms must be mighty, ready for instant action, so that no potential aggressor may be tempted to risk his own destruction.